This is the day that the Lord has made. And we have the assurance of the presence of Christ being with us, not only here, but there in your homes. We're glad that you've joined us. David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I agree, this is going to be different, but I am confident of this one thing. The God most high in heaven above is revealing himself to us, each one of us, personally. Whether we are in this building as a congregation in a church or there in your homes, I'm telling you that the presence of God is very near. When will the church open again? Well, we don't know. But I sure hope that we're able to experience his presence together on Resurrection Sunday. So you pray real hard and we'll see what God will do. I want to challenge you to check in to FraserRoad.com often for updates, video clips, and announcements. It's there that you're going to be briefed on what's happening here in the church or any announcements that you need to be made aware of. I also want to encourage you about giving. During this time, if you will continue to support the work of Fraser Road Church of God, the ministries continue to go forward. So you can give online, either by a one-time gift or arranging for a weekly amount to be automatically sent to Fraser Road. And you can also mail your offerings in here to Fraser Road Church of God, 2755 Fraser Road, Coca-Cola, Michigan, 48631. It will be important during this current crisis that we all continue to support the ongoing work of this ministry. There's never been a greater opportunity for us to reach out to minister to people than right now. Please just do support with your tithes and your offerings. Now, I want you to get ready because we're going to worship. I have a word for you that I believe is going to encourage you and we're going to share together seeking God's face and God's presence. Would you pray with me before we begin? Father, I want to thank you so much for your Holy Spirit that you have given to us. And you're not limited by time or distance. You're the God most high that's making yourself the God most nigh unto each and every one of us. So come, Holy Spirit, breathe life into this time as we share together. And we'll give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. So uh, we're a little bit uh, distant right now, but uh, I want to share a passage of scripture with you. Um, it's from John 4, and starting in the 21st verse, it's the, the Samaritan woman that Jesus met at the well. Uh, it says, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. And then skipping down to verse 23, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And Jesus was saying to her, It doesn't matter where you are, but there's an hour coming that you'll be able to worship in spirit and in truth. And we're living in that hour right now. So let's worship him together in Jesus' name. Just run into it. 
players say the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run into it they are saying blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be the name of the Lord most high be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Amen. Praise the Lord. Be thou my vision. Strangely dim in the light. 
praise the Lord. We praise you this morning, Father. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you're real, that you're here right now, Father, that you love us, God, and that you have a plan for us, even in the midst of hard times. And God, we just surrender to you, Father. We want everything that you have to give us, Lord. I just ask that you would just put your anointing on every single person, Lord, that's listening right now in the name of Jesus, and that you would allow us to hear exactly what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that we would all agree that this is an hour of great uncertainty. And there has never been a time, maybe quite like this in our lifetime, where the foundations seem to be cracking and crumbling. In this hour of uncertainty, we also acknowledge that it's an hour of great mediocrity. As we recognize that many of us in the church recognize a period or a season in which the church or Christians have been mediocre or lukewarm. And in some ways, this has awakened us to our desperate need for God. In this hour of uncertainty and the hour of mediocrity, it is also a great hour of opportunity. Never maybe in our lifetime has there also been an opportunity for us to advance the cause of Christ, to encourage people with the truth that there is hope in this time of uncertainty through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that when the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? These foundations that are cracking and crumbling, a world that is asking questions, where terror and fear is gripping the hearts of so many people, and we're asking ourselves the question, what can the righteous do? Much of life as we have known it has been disrupted. We don't know if things will ever be quite the same, and probably not. The distractions have been silenced. Many of the things that this world and culture has embraced as idols and gods and high places have been brought down. Sporting events have been shut down. The bars have been closed. Restaurants have been shut down. And many of the things that we have turned to and looked for our entertainment have been silenced. It's as if God has taken this period and has simply silenced all of the distractions, maybe for our benefit as the church, to really pinpoint our focus upon our relationship with him. What can you and I do, and where can we turn in these troubled times that we're living in? The Bible tells us that Satan is a liar, and he's a deceiver. But there's another interesting fact about Satan, and that is the fact that he is a, a counterfeit. The only thing that Satan can do is to mimic many things you and I might turn to in this world for our hope and our security could oftentimes be simply counterfeits that the enemy has offered individuals. Fear and terror is causing people to act in unusual ways and chase after all kinds of crazy stuff in this day. You and I are going to have to walk very, very closely to Jesus right now in this present hour we're going to have to turn to him. Jesus warned us about the last days, the end times, that people would be deceived, that they would chase after the wrong things. And you and I are going to have to beware of enemy tactics, especially right now. The enemy, Satan, tries to duplicate God. He tries to mimic him. And that's the reason that many people are deceived and why the Bible warns us about it. Satan tries to mimic Jesus and his behavior and how he established his kingdom. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's referred to as the Antichrist. Satan imitates, and those who are alert are aware of his tactics. But those that are not alert will oftentimes be deceived. There's some interesting aspects in the Bible when you look at this as to how Satan tries to mimic and duplicate the, uh, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God's people are called the children of God in Romans 8. And yet, it also tells us in Matthew 13 that Satan's people are called the children of the wicked one. The Bible says in Philippians that God is working in his children to do his good pleasure. But the Bible also says that Satan is the prince in the power of the air now working 
in the children, the children of disobedience. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul said that the devil has a gospel. It's called another gospel. Jesus appointed apostles while he was there or here. In 2 Corinthians, it says Satan also has his false apostles. Christ will seal his servants with a mark in their foreheads. That's what Revelation tells us. Satan also has a mark that will pl be planted on the foreheads of those who follow him. The Father seeks true worshipers. Satan also seeks his worshipers. Christ quoted scripture. Satan will also quote scripture. Christ is the light of the world. The Bible tells us that Satan will transform himself into an angel of light. Christ is the Lion of Judah. The Bible says in 1 Peter that Satan will prowl about like a roaring lion. You have in the Bible Christ and his angels as described in Matthew 24. But in the 25th chapter of Matthew, you have Satan and his angels. We have Christ seated on the throne. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 2.13 that Satan is all seated, also seated on a throne. You have Christ and his church. And the Bible says in Revelation 2.9 that there's a synagogue of Satan. The Bible tells us that Christ has his bride. But it also reveals that Satan has what the Bible calls a whore. Satan has a whore and Christ has his bride, the church. Jesus has a city and it's called the New Jerusalem. The Antichrist has a city called Babylon. There's a mystery of godliness, the Bible says in 1 Peter. And there's also a mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians. Christ is called the seed of the woman. Satan is called the seed of the serpent. Christ is called the son of man. The Antichrist is called the son of perdition. There is a holy trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's also an unholy trinity, Satan, who's the dragon, the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. When we look at the devil, the person, the devil, if you take away the D, you have evil. If you take away the D-E, it leaves vile. And if you take away D-E-V, it leaves ill. Satan's objective is to get you bound up, looking at the wrong things. He's the one who masquerades as the angel of light, and he's doing everything he can to trip us up to trick us, to deceive us, or to distract us and turn us to the wrong things in this very important season we're in so that our security is in things rather than in Christ. One day, a woman with a terrible physical condition came to Jesus. She had physical problems. She had emotional issues. And she had been rejected by most of society. In Matthew chapter, in Mark chapter 5, in the 24th verse, the Bible says that Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. That a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Here is a woman who had exhausted all of her resources. Physically, there was nowhere else that she could turn. She had been rejected and she was an outcast. This was an embarrassing situation. And in fact, really, even by the moral code that had been established, she shouldn't have even been out in public. She should have isolated herself. But here is a woman that has so desperate and there was nowhere else to turn, but she had heard about Jesus. And she decided that she would give Jesus a try. In the 27th verse, the Bible says, And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. 
The Bible says immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Something was transported from Jesus into the woman. She was looking for an answer. She was desperate for some miracle that would alter the situations. And she came to Jesus. But there was something that happened when this woman in faith touched the garment of Jesus. Something was imputed into her. She felt power coming into her. And at the same time, Jesus felt power going out of her. The Bible tells us something interesting in Matthew chapter 14 in the 35th verse about this power. Matthew 14 verse 35, the Bible says, And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent out into all the surrounding regions, brought to Jesus all who were sick, and begging him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and the Bible says, and as many as touched it were made perfectly well. Something flowed from Jesus into the people. And the reputation of that became so broad that individuals were coming to Jesus just to touch him, knowing that something would flow from him into them. Now turning over to the book of Luke, in the 6th chapter, and the 19th verse, the Bible says, And the whole multitude sought to touch Jesus. The whole multitude sought to touch Jesus, for power went out from him and healed them all. Again, the Bible tells us that there was some power, some presence, some anointing, some glory that was transferred from Jesus into the people. I want you to consider that we don't just have Jesus with us. The Bible suggests that in Revelations that Jesus is actually standing at a door, the door of your heart, and he's knocking. And the Bible says that if you'll open that door, that Jesus will come in to this soul, this spirit, this temple, this tabernacle. Jesus is knocking, but you and I must let him in. But we've got something that this woman that the Bible talks about didn't have. We have Jesus not just with us, but we have the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us and who atoned our sins, we have this Jesus now living on the very inside of us. The Christ that people wanted to get to just to touch his clothing is now living on the inside of us. We have something that that woman and the people of that day did not have. We have resurrection power. That Jesus who lives inside of me is the Christ who died on the cross and rose again on the third day. And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives on the inside of us. And we have a promise that Jesus told his disciples about. That's the Holy Spirit. He said the Holy Spirit is with you, but he shall be in you. And consider the fact that this Holy Spirit that Jesus said, I'm going away so that the Holy Spirit can come and he's going to be your comforter and your counselor and he's going to empower you that this same Holy Spirit's not just with us, but this Holy Spirit is inside of us. Now I want you to think about this because the woman with the issue of blood that just wanted to touch the garment of Jesus and the many people of that community that wanted to get to Jesus just to touch his clothing is the Christ who lives inside of us. And this Jesus and that power and that anointing is of great significance for you as we combat all the forces of darkness and the hour that we live in. Now, I feel there's a missing dimension in many professing Christians' lives. And that missing dimension, many do not have an inner peace. 
They do not have an inner sense of this marvelous glory of God. No joy, no sense of God's intimate presence in their life. No power, no hope, and their life is filled with a terror and a fear of what might happen on tomorrow. Can I encourage you today that we have something through Jesus Christ the world cannot experience. The world didn't give it to us, and the world certainly cannot take it away. Now, I don't know what's going to happen on tomorrow, but I do know who holds tomorrow. Can you imagine what would happen to the church? What would happen in professing believers and their lives if we, like the people we read about in the Bible, were to get so close to Jesus, we ended up brushing against him? We began to identify and align ourselves with the truth that this Christ, the resurrected Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, and we were to do more than just touch some clothing, but we were to touch Christ in a very personal and profound way, and that virtue would flow through us at a greater intensity than they ever encountered back then. This is what I see in the Bible as the potential for the soaking presence of Christ. You see, Moses understood this aspect of soaking in the presence of God. The Bible tells us that Moses, at 80 years of age, climbed a mountain. And when he got up there where God was, that he simply stayed in the presence of God for six days, never said one word. There was no utterance from God. There was no communication between Moses and God. But for six days of silence, what did he do? I believe that for six days, Moses was content to merely exist and linger in the presence of God. And Moses soaked up the presence of God like a sponge. And when he came down from that mountain, he radiated with the Shekinah of God because he had opened himself up to the flow of the living reality of God into his life. There is no limit to your soul's capacity to receive of the things of God. And what you and I have experienced yesterday is not sufficient to sustain us today. But God wants to reveal himself. I see it in Joshua. When Moses went to the tent of the meeting, the Bible tells us that Joshua, his young aide, went into that tabernacle, the tent of meeting with him. And when Moses, the Bible says that the glory cloud came down, that God visited that tent of meeting. When Moses came out of there, the Bible says that Joshua remained in that tent. Why do you suppose he did? Because the lingering presence of the glory of God was in that place. And the Shekinah of God was just so powerful, he didn't want to leave it. He was not anxious to get out of that atmosphere of the glory. So he hung on to it and he soaked it up. And Joshua, we read about in the Bible, became a mighty man of God who would become the next leader, a fierce soldier for God's name and, not, and his sake. We also have a picture of Paul in the Bible, the Apostle Paul. And Paul has what the scriptures define as a thorn in the flesh. Now, Paul had been taken up into the third heaven. He said, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But whatever encounter that Paul had in the heavenlies with Christ transformed him for the rest of his journey. He would never be the same. So even with this thorn of the flesh in his life, of which the scripture identifies it as a messenger of Satan to buffet him, even though God did not take that away, Paul was content to yield and surrender to that of that uh, bondage, that problem, that trouble, that buffeting of the enemy because he had been up into the presence of God and he had experienced the Shekinah of God and it maintained him, it sustained him and he soaked up the presence of God and he said that that was sufficient. That's all he needed was the glory and the grace of God. I want to share with you about getting close to Jesus during this time of our life. You see, whether there's a crisis or there's not a crisis, 
I don't think there's anything that is more significant in your life journey and attention and focus than to just be deliberate about getting closer to Jesus. It's the answer for everything. I'm telling you, it's the answer for your financial concerns. It's the answer for physical affliction. It's the answer for worry. It's an answer for, or for all kinds of trouble, disappointment, discouragement. Getting close to Jesus, that virtue is all that's needed in your life and my life. Do we believe what the Bible says as an invitation that if we will draw near to God, he will draw near to us? That somehow heaven is waiting for us to demonstrate not only a faith, what God says that he'll do, but a desperation to say, I'm not satisfied with my present condition, my spiritual state, and I want a little bit more of God in my life. So you're determining the extent of your intimacy with God. I'm determining the extent of how close I am to God. It really rests in my hands whether I will cooperate with God in his invitation to pursue him. You shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And I would say then let's do it. During this time of all times, Let's decide we're not going to look to Washington. We're not going to look to the stock market. We're not going to look to the counselors and all of the voices that are out there. But we'll look to the sure foundation of God's word. We're going to look heavenward and we're going to press in and we're going to draw nearer to God in this time. Let's take our Jesus and let's take his death and his resurrection along with the good Holy Spirit and let's touch him with a desperation and an expectation that will pave the way that I can experience a personal awakening that possibly could trickle over into the lives of other people. Because if touching the garment of Jesus brought an impartation, then think about what would happen if my life, radiating the glory of God, others touch me or others come into the atmosphere of where I'm at. Is it not possible that you and I as the church could impact this world that we're living in right now that's desperately searching for some hope in the darkness that prevails. But how do we put this into practice? We can talk about growing closer to Jesus and all of the language and rhetoric about doing it, but what does it really mean to put that into practice practically in my life? Can I give you three things that I believe will help to launch you into a more deeper, intimate walk with God. First of all, we'll have to do what Jesus said. When you pray, go into your closet and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in heaven and your Father who's in heaven will, will see what you're doing in secret and he will reward you openly. Now God cannot lie, but there's some secret experience that's been reserved for you and I, if we will follow that, if we'll do that one thing secretly, God has given us a guarantee that he's going to reward us openly. And what do you think the reward is? Do you think the reward is a financial provision? Do you think the reward is some physical healing, an answer to prayer? Or is it possible that this reward is the revealing of God's presence in a deeper and more intimate way in our lives than we've ever experienced. To me, that would be, wouldn't it, the greater blessing that God could possibly offer us. So, could we take what God says, what could we do in a practical way to experience greater intimacy with God? I think we're going to have to go into our closet, whatever that might mean, and we're going to have to shut the door to the world. We're going to have to turn off the voices that are all around us. And we're going to have to make an appointment, a deliberate appointment with God. Things that are important in our life, we make an appointment with them. We make appointments with our doctors. We make an appointment with, with uh, our bank and bankers when we're making a loan. We make appointments with things that are important. And I would suggest to you that it's important for us to make an appointment with God every day to be intentional about pursuing God. No excuse. You and I have all the time right now. Everything's been shut down. I have heard people say for a long time, I just don't have time to read the word. I don't have time to pray as much as I'd like to pray. I don't have time to read that book that, that uh, you know, might encourage me spiritually. I just don't have the time. Can I tell you that we've got plenty of time now?
All the things that consumed us in this world have been closed down, shut down. Now you and I have plenty of time. Baby, God's done that just for you so that you and I could spend more time now getting alone with God. Take your Bible. No agenda but to experience him. No prayer list of wants and things that you need. But just simply take your Bible, close the door, and get into the presence of God. Put on some instrumental music and just wait there in the presence of God. That's the second thing that we're going to have to do. This is a practical response. Not only do we need to shut the door and open our hearts to God, but we're going to have to learn to wait upon the Lord. Not to rush. You see, sometimes when we go into our prayer closet or our time alone with God, we're anxious and we're thinking about things we need to do and phone calls are coming in and we feel rushed. And I'm saying to you that we're going to have to learn to wait but the, because the discovery of intimacy with God is found in the waiting. The Bible tells us that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Be still and know that I'm God, the Bible says. Sometimes we have to just, and, and it's interesting because the hardest thing for your flesh to do, you can do all kinds of other things in the flesh. You and I can worship in the flesh. We can preach or teach in the flesh. We can minister in the flesh. But when it comes to silence before God and really seeking his face, our flesh will rebel and our mind will begin to just turn all kinds of thoughts and, and, and it will just begin to stir on the inside because your flesh doesn't want to die. Your flesh does not like the idea of, of submitting unto the Lordship of Christ and allowing your spirit to have communion with God. So I'm saying you and I are going to have to learn to wait in the stillness. In the stillness of that closed door, you and I will begin to experience his nearness. As we open the word and we allow God to speak to us, the Holy Spirit's going to help you. And in that atmosphere, we like Moses and Joshua and the Apostle Paul, we're going to, this is soaking time. This is the fuel of the Spirit. More than anything else you can do, this time of being alone with Jesus is going to, you're going to absorb it and it's going to super charge you and the virtue that was imputed into that woman because of clothing the Shekinah glory of God in that closed quiet moment is going to be imputed into your life you're going to come out of that closet a different person and you'll have a different eye for what's going on around you you're going to see the kingdom of God and the power of the lordship of Christ then there's a third thing that you and I can do in a practical sense and that is that you and I learn to pray over an open Bible. I think there's a distortion of what prayer really means. Sure, there are times that we ask God for things and, and we're seeking for his help. But, but I'm speaking of prayer here as fellowship with God. Just intimacy with Jesus. No agenda other than to experience his company in your life. And can I suggest to you that you and I begin to pray over an open Bible? That we read a few verses and we speak those back to God. We meditate. We, we, there's no power greater than us speaking back to God. What is anointed that he has given us through his holy scriptures. Going to God, no lists, no request, just soaking time with Jesus. And we're going to pray the word back to God. And listen for the Lord to speak to us. And I'm saying to you that if we'll practice the, that principle of just getting alone with God, soon you will flush out of your life, life the yuck and the undesirable, that which distracts, that which weighs you down, that which is so heavy a burden in your life. It'll be like getting all the toxins out of your soul. And the only way that you and I can do that, oh, we can pray, and we can beg, we can plead. But I'm saying you get into the atmosphere of the glory. You get there where Jesus says, if the woman touching Jesus cleansed her flesh so that she was healed, consider what can happen in your life and my life. If we'll get into the atmosphere in the company of Jesus and that same virtue now not on the outside but on the inside and when that virtue begins to flow through us, it will cleanse us, it will purge us, it will flush us out and we'll begin to experience. Let it happen for two or three days. Don't give up. Keep doing it and I'm saying to you, it will transform your life. And there are many things the Lord's going to want to flush out of your life and my life. Things that cloud his presence. 
Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's uh, resentment. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, all kinds of things that you've struggled with. I'm saying to you that if you'll get in there and shut the door and you'll wait on him with an open Bible that God will speak to you and in the company of his presence he will flush you out and in that cloud of his presence as we experience him he will transform us and he will transform our perspective on life. The Bible says in the world and Jesus said in the world you have tribulation but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I don't know about you. There's nowhere else that you and I can turn. I'm thankful for political leaders and their responsibilities of helping us in every way that they can. But our hope is not in Washington. It's not in the president. Our hope is not in the stock market. Our hope is not in the medical profession. Those are all instruments that God can use. But our hope is only firmly fixed in who Jesus Christ is. He is not just a good man. He is the very son of God. Who came and conquered all the powers of darkness. And because he lives. We also will live. I want to challenge you in these days that we're living. Is to get alone with God. To seek his face. To shut off Netflix. To shut off Facebook. To get all the distractions. This doesn't accomplish anything if we're merely replacing those pockets of time with other distractions. But I'm saying to you, could we shut it down and could we devote more time to Jesus, more time to God? Could we dare to believe that what the woman experienced by just touching his clothing can happen in a more real and vivid way today because we're touching more than his clothing. We are touching the realm of his glory and when we touch him in faith when we dare to believe that the God most high becomes God most nigh in our life I'm telling you he will recreate your whole life and he will lift the burden break all of the insecurities and all of the high places in your own life and when he does that you'll be a changed man and a changed woman and you will have a confidence in living like never before because you'll know that through Jesus Christ we can do all things Things, and I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you this morning for the presence of your Holy Spirit that's here in this sanctuary right now and the Holy Spirit that's visiting supernaturally every home that's viewing this right now. May you awaken us. May there be, we pray, an impartation. I pray the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come. Tug our heart, arouse our hunger and our thirst and our desire. Create within us, I pray, a new appetite for the things of the Spirit. Get us ready for your soon return. Help us to be the church triumphant. As we look towards you, we pray, oh God, may you transform us. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, amen and amen.
from within and make me holy purify my heart cleanse me from my sin and deep within and refiner's fire and my heart's one is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord, I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master. Ready to do your will and refiner's fire, and my heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master. I'm ready to do your will. Praise you, Lord. Amen. Church family, we're so glad that you joined us this morning, and just uh, we hope that you're you guys are drawn closer as a family, and we hope that you're drawn closer to Christ, and know that we love you guys, and we can't wait to, to get back together with you. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.